What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lacey within the studio with MJ, and I'm here with Brad Sunberg. Brad, it's uh, good to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> how you doing, Chris? It's kind of fun being in the guest chair for a change. How, how's yeah. your day? Uh, my day's been going really well, really well. I've been looking forward to catching up with you and uh, diving into uh, you know, what brought you into the MJ world and, you know, what you've been able to experience in the time that you've been an engineer and, and what you've learned from, you know, from all the uh, experiences that you've had. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, th th this is fun and Chris and I are going to have fun doing this. Um, it's, it's just fun to kind of have the, the, the roles reversed, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, Chris, I, uh, I, First met Michael in late 1984, early 1985, long before you were born, I'm sure. And uh, uh, Michael, I got a, well, I'll even roll the train back a little bit more. Um, when I was a kid, I either wanted to be a pilot or a recording engineer or a chef. Huh. And I, when you went to high school in Central California, they had no idea what a recording engineer was. Uh, going to chef school was outrageously expensive, and uh, I didn't want to join the Air Force. So I moved to L.A. and uh, got married, been married to Deb for uh, 35 years. Um, Congratulations on that. Thank you. i uh, got four beautiful girls, and uh, so I'm, I'm a very happy, blessed man. Um, so we moved to LA. I went to a little recording school that has long since gone out of business called Sound Masters. And uh, that's, I'm so grateful for that year. It was a one year, not crash course, but it was a really intensive course that taught me the basics. And there's things that I learned in that school. I mean, now I teach, um, not full time, but I teach at Abbey Road Studios in London and in Paris. Mm. I teach at SAE schools all through Europe and in the U.S. And it's funny, I go back to some of those basic fundamentals that I learned, um, and they still apply to this day. So while I was in school, I got a job at Westlake Studios. Um, here's my, my first name drop of Michael Jackson. Um, I'm not a huge, or I wasn't a huge Michael Jackson fan. Just being honest. Yeah. I grew up on rock and roll. I grew up on Van Halen, ACDC, and I owned Thriller. Like everybody else on the planet, I probably went through two or three copies of Thriller. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I absolutely, I loved the music, but I loved the sound. And it was the sound of Thriller. I'm, I would dissect those songs and I would listen to those drums and try and figure out reverbs and sounds. And I didn't even really know what I was listening for, but it was almost like a masterclass in listening. Yeah. So when I started at Westlake, um, well, let me just be honest. I, I had the Thriller album and I read the liner notes. We used to have liner notes on albums. You know, we'd read where it was recorded and everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Recorded and mixed by Bruce Swedeen at Westlake Audio. I open up the phone book, Westlake Audio, call them up. I said, I want to work for you. Um, it's absolutely true. And wow. I went down, I, I filled out a little application, and I got a job as a runner, empty trash cans, cleaned out the refrigerator, cleaned toilets, made coffee, and that's how I started. And I was at Westlake maybe six, eight, ten weeks, something like that, on Beverly okay. Boulevard in L.A., and I met Michael Jackson. He, he was there working on Captain EO. And I, I've told this story so many times, but I never know if there's a new listener or not. But, um, but we, you know, we didn't become BFFs, you know, we weren't clubbing or anything like that. I'm a pretty boring guy at the end of the day. But I made him laugh. He made me laugh. Um, we had a really cool connection. And we just became friends. And that friendship remained for the course of 18, 19 years. Um, so I kind of worked myself into the team and uh, uh, Bruce and Quincy and Rod kind of took me in. Uh, Michael trusted me. Um, and and it, was a, it was a good little group, a cohesive little group. 
And uh, so we started the Bad Album, and I was still what's called a, an assistant engineer. Um, mm -hmm. So I was I was still vacuuming floors, and I was working on McDonald's commercials. Um, and then at night, I'd run into Studio D, and I'd watch the Bad Album uh, being recorded. And over the course of time, uh, Bruce's assistant, Craig, went off on a, his own solo career, and the slot opened up, and Bruce asked me to step up, and that's where it started. So it was wow. during Bad that I really connected with the team. Now, do you remember, uh, I guess, the first song or, or even the first demo that you got to sit in and kind of witness Michael, Quincy, and Bruce all working together on? You were like, wow, like, I'm, I get to be a fly on the wall during this project. Well, I'm actually going to, I'll, I'll go back in time earlier than that. That would have been Captain EO. So okay. it, was, gotcha. it was Captain EO when Matt Forger was the lead engineer. Mm -hmm. um, and... I, let's see if I'm being honest. I probably was not there for vocals during Captain EO. I, I, I can't remember. Captain EO was, it was, I may have been, but it was, it was very, oh man, I don't want to say loose, but it, there were just fun, loose sessions. Whereas with Bruce and Quincy and Rod, and I mean, those are big heavyweight sessions. So sure. I got to meet Michael on a way lower key project. Um, so I was hearing, uh, we are here to change the world and another part of me and a couple other, right in that same time, Reby was doing her project centipede and centipede, Michael was yeah. involved in that. So that was mm -hmm. for a little while that was in studio B, Michael was in studio A. So I was just kind of, and I'm so new. I mean, I'm just like wide-eyed and like you know and i knew enough just to keep my mouth shut and just mm -hmm. watch um and so you know so then during the bad album i was going back and forth to havenhurst and michael was doing a lot of rough cuts up there um but i, I think if there was and this isn't the song i'm going to talk about but i think on the bad album th there's just so many monster hits but um uh, the way you make me feel. I mean, mm -hmm. when I, when I saw the background vocals for that come together and then the lead vocal and just that thunderous bass. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little something I talk about in my seminars. Yeah. If you take the song, the way you make me feel and put it into any decent computer with, with a little sound, uh, sound car, no, you know, sound controller on it. <laughs> I'm a professional. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you slow it down about 5.5%, that's the speed it was recorded at. And you'll actually wow. get it on key. And then you hear that bass, that boom, 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 boom. And it's just got so much more attitude. And instead of it, you know, instead of it being a little dance song where Michael's just going crazy, it's actually, it's just, it's grittier. And so that's how I heard it. I'd walk into the room with it at that slower speed, the original speed. And I, and I was hooked. I mean, it was like, this is, I've said this a few times. When you walk into a room like that with, you know, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but Michael Jackson, Quincy Jones, Rod Temperton, Bruce Swedeen, Jerry Hay. And it's like, there's no place else on the planet I'd rather be. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a really cool feeling. There was a name that you had mentioned that um, that as a longtime Michael fan, I've always been curious to know if maybe you can, you probably talked about this at your seminars, is that for Off the Wall and Thriller, Rod Temperton's presence is is there on that record, and then for Bad, it's the first time that we don't hear him, and Michael's really taking on the show. Uh, he's shouldering the workload of of the songs that are recorded and and officially you know show up on the album. Um, are you privy to what? what was behind that? Was it just Michael wanting to take on more of the album or was there like a, a mutual parting of the ways? Well, no, to be clear, and, and I'm being a hundred percent honest. No, Rod was there every day. Rod was okay. there every okay. day of the bad album. Um, huh. Probably more consistent than Michael. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rod, uh, he, he wrote several songs and, and I, I, 
I'm not trying to be evasive. I just, I can't remember the song titles. He did present some songs for, for the bad album. Rod's the sweetest guy on the planet. Um, I, I love Rod Temperton. Um, we got to be very good friends outside of the projects and I wound up building three or four, I think four recording studios for Rod, um, both in the U S and in Europe. Very, I didn't, you know, I mean, I'm so happy that you mentioned him because, because I have such huge respect and he's, he's one of those guys that he is just a little bit of a, a mystery man in the, you know, Quincy and I love Quincy. And, and whenever somebody sure. says something neg- negative about Quincy, about a tweet or something that he, I'm like, come on, well, big picture, big picture, you know, look at the body of work. Don't get wrapped yeah. up in one tweet. Um, but Quincy is a very familiar face and some of the people know Bruce in his own way is very well known, you know, especially in the, in the recording world. Um, sure. Mike, Michael is Michael. Um, Rod, you're right, is, is a bit more, not an invisible man, but he's just behind the scenes, and he liked it there. Mm-hmm. Funny, sharp sense of humor, not, mm-hmm. it's not like he was shy, he just didn't seek out the publicity, and he mm-hmm. wrote amazing songs, uh, arranged, uh, you know, the, the arrangements he can come up with are, are just spectacular, and yeah. uh, so he was there, and, and I, I completely understand your question uh, he just didn't and however the the money you know I don't know I honestly you know but he was there and if Michael needed an idea or I mean he was just part of this creative team I mm-hmm. was part of the technical team I'm not gonna gotcha. tell Michael how to do a harmony um, but Rod was right there in the middle of, you know, maybe you should try this, try this. So you're right. In print, you don't see it, but in your ears, you hear it. He's still there. That's awesome. That's awesome. And and I'm glad that you guys uh, built a friendship outside of the studio and, and, and God rest his soul. One, one yeah. of the things I really admire about him is that for someone to come from England and have such a profound respect and understanding of black music and be able to, like you said, have an ear for, uh, for what sounds good, like what's going to sure. get people moving and, and, and just the pure groove of it. Um, yeah, he, he'll, he'll always be remembered as one of the all time great. So I'm glad that you guys developed the friendship. Well, and, uh, and, and I know, I know you're familiar with heat wave. I mean, the stuff that oh, he yeah. did, <laughs> it's just, and here again, I'm, and I'm, I'm always, you know, careful with my words, but I hope not too careful, but I'm a white mm-hmm. kid from Santa Cruz, California. But I yeah. did grow up on disco and on ABBA and on rock. Mm-hmm. And even me, I loved Heat Wave. There's no reason I would have even known who they were. But if that, you know, those songs are just stupid. They're so good. So then I, yeah. you know, then, I <laughs> then I get to meet Rod. And then you, as you get older, you look back and you go, why didn't I ask this? And why I didn't know he was involved in that. And the mm-hmm. the cool connect the dots of these guys in the music industry is really fascinating. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, um, I know that you had mentioned earlier that there is a song on the bad album in particular that you wanted to talk about. So I'll let you uh, take it away from there. What, what, what song did you want to tackle tonight? So the, well, the, the bad, I worked on so many songs with Michael and I'm not, I'm not saying that as bragging, but, um, but, but I was very blessed to be part of the team for so long. Mm-hmm. And when I started this series of, uh, I think I call it, you know, seven, seven songs and seven stories or something, um, mm-hmm. I, I wasn't sure if I'd include myself in it. And, and now we're just being candid. Um, part of the reason that I, that I brought Chris in is I, I, I actually like this concept of instead of me just sitting here talking for, you know, however long, um, I like some, some give and take. So, so thank you, Chris, for jumping in and doing it. Um, sure. when I thought about the, the body of work and, you know, gee, what song should I go after? I mean, I could have been really, uh, edgy and gone after morphine or something, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, or else you've got, you know, the big heavy hitters, you know, the way you make me feel a man in the mirror, but the song that so many people clown on 
and I think it's the little engine that could, is a song called Just Good Friends uh, oh, with, with Stevie Wonder. Okay. <laughs> See, that's okay. Uh, go ahead and laugh. Um, <laughs> it's before I did this, I, in fact, I'm going to switch screens and I hope I don't mess things up because I got to be able to come back. Um, but I'm hoping you can still see me, but I'm going to jump over and I'm going to read, uh, what the Rolling Stones said about, uh, just good friends, the only mediocrity on bad. Um, he attributed the fact that just good friends is one of two songs actually not written by Jackson on the album. Rolling Stone commented that Stevie Wonder duet starts well, but devolves into a chin-bobbing cheerfulness that is unforced, but also sadly unearned. That's, mm. <laughs> that's, that's harsh. harsh criticism. <laughs> um, so harsh. what I want to do is just talk for a couple of minutes. Um, is it a great song? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's up to, up to the ear of, of the listener, I guess. Right. But I want to talk about a little bit why it's a special song for me. Um, so in my imagination, if you're listening to the bad album, and I guess people don't listen to CDs anymore, but I, I, I pulled the CD out. Um, it, you know, it used to be you'd listen to the bad album either on vinyl or on cassette or on, or on CD. Mm-hmm. And I guess you'd get the just good friends <laughs> and a lot of people just hit skip. Um, and that's okay. I can't, you know, I'm not, I'm not asking you to make your, your favorite song, but I want to tell you my perspective of it. So first of all, um, I pulled out this cassette. You guys are going to be yelling at me. Um, this is from, uh, mm, August of 1987. Um, this is the, the, what was going to be, this was kind of the album at that point. And we had Streetwalker, Bad, Hot Fever. Hot Fever became The Way You Make Me Feel. Uh, Speed Demon, Liberian Girl, Just Good Friends, Another Part of Me, Man in the Mirror, I Just Can't Stop, Dirty Diana, and Smooth. Um, I don't think we had really started working on Leave Me Alone yet. I'm not, I can't remember. But Just Good Friends is on there. Even though Streetwalker is still on there, and eventually we, you know, Streetwalker got broomed, which I love Streetwalker. So it was a song that was, it was going to be on from fairly early in the project. I don't, I'm just being honest. I, I don't remember every conversation, and I wasn't, I wasn't there when, you know, Quincy and Michael were having their private meetings and all that. But I think it's something that Michael really wanted to do. And I'm sure there have been people way smarter than me that have done interviews about this and have written giant blogs about it. I, I, I don't have anything except my memory and a few, and a few little mementos. Um, if you read the, and the print is so freaking small, but if you read the liner notes on Just Good Friends, the guys that played on this thing, forget about Stevie and Michael for a second. We're at the point where we're just building the song. And these are the guys that I see in the studio every day. Not every day, but I mean, it's, it's the regular guys. Um, Michael Landau, please. Michael Landau on guitar. Um, Gary Grant, Jerry Hay on trumpets. Uh, Larry Williams on sax uh, with, with Kim H- uh, Hutchcroft. Um, You've got uh, Chris Carell on Sinclair, Paulinho, freaking Paulinho da Costa. Da Costa, yeah. Room full. When, when Paulinho would come into the studio, i got to get rid of something here. When Paulinho would come into the studio, they'd back up, I don't know, it was like a 40-foot truck or whatever it was, and start unloading every percussion thing you can imagine. Bell trees wow. and kungas and timbales and kettle drums and fill the studio. And maybe all Paulinho would do is just a shaker egg, you know, but all this stuff took so much time and money. Um, uh, Michael Boddicker and I were just talking about budgets a couple, couple nights ago. Um, and just the cartage costs alone 
which is now people don't even know what that means. What cartage is, is if Paulinho is going to work at our studio, he has to hire a company to come pack all of his percussion stuff up, drive it to Westlake, unload everything, and prep it for him. Mm-hmm. And it was hours. I mean, it was to move Paulinho, it'd be hundreds and hundreds of dollars on top of his his fee. So you've got Paulinho on here. Um, okay, well then, of course, let's bring in um, Michael Boddicker, Rhett Lawrence, and Greg Gates. You've got <laughs> – it's just three machine gunners, three bazookas of uh, – uh, of, of synthesizers and Larry, I think Larry Williams uh, gets credit for synth also. Larry was, um, we saw Larry all the time. So Larry mm-hmm. comes from a band called Sea Wind. So the Sea Wind Horns. Sea Wind Horns, yeah. Yeah. So that's where Larry and Jerry and all these guys come from. So Larry's an amazing saxophone player. Then he migrated into keyboards. So all of a sudden he's also kind of the king of the LA keyboard guys. And he's kind of in that top five that we keep seeing over and over again. Um, Let's see, Larry, this is really exciting uh, visuals here. Um, Then you've got, it was written by uh, Terry Britton and Graham Graham Lyle. Lyle. And and I, I don't, don't remember. I don't, man, I'm going to embarrass myself bad. I don't know if they came to the studio or not. I don't remember meeting them. But and, that, and that was a question I was going to ask you is just knowing like, I think at that point before they hopped onto the bad project, I think their biggest hit at that time was uh, what's love got to do with it with Tina Turner. Wow. Okay. And that yeah. was a few years earlier, if I'm not mistaken. It was 84, 85 ish. So, so it was a couple, it was right around that time that Michael started recording bad. Okay. And, and I'm yeah. just being, I mean, they, they could have, you know, if, if they say we were there, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to argue. No, no. I, I don't remember them having a real presence in the arrangement of the song. Um, mm-hmm. And then the last credit, and of course you've got, uh, you know, Quincy being credited, and then you've got um, horn arrangement by Jerry Hay. Mm-hmm. Listen to Just Good Friends and try to take the vocals out of your, your ear mix just listen to the freaking horns. That horn arrangement is gorgeous. Yeah. So, so in all these songs, you've kind of got the Quincy formula. Um, and again, I'm a nobody. I'm, I'm a fly on the wall at this point. Mm-hmm. But I'm smart enough to know these, these guys really know what they're doing. Um, so you've got Rod, who we already talked about. Mm-hmm. Jerry is there a lot. You got Quincy. Quincy's there really every day. You know, people have talked about how in later projects, you know, Quincy would, you know, kind of phone it in and, you know, change this, change this. On the Bad Album, Quincy was there every day. Um, you know, he may have left for a meeting now and then, but but he was there. He was producing that record. Um, and so you've got Michael doing background vocals on Just Good Friends, I'm pretty sure he did the 16 tracks of background vocals, four-part harmony. Mm -hmm. Um, You've got this amazing bed of music that, honestly, if it were on somebody else's record, it'd be like, this guy really knows what he's doing. Um, But because it's in this, you know, it's tucked in with bad and the way you make me feel and all these other monsters, um, I think it gets clowned on just a little bit. I agree with you. The surrounding tracks, just the magnitude of them tend to kind of dwarf just good friends. But if you put that on anybody else's record, you're bound to have a a, a radio hit right. with that song. So I agree with you. And it was never released as a single. I mean, I'd kind of, I, I'd, uh, at least if I believe Wikipedia, but, um, but holy cow, just about every other song on the record was. So, yeah. um, so, you've got to set that stage where I'm coming into the studio day after day. Is it my favorite song? No, but they're all good. And, yes. and there's kind of this anticipation of Stevie Wonder's going to come, you know, Stevie Wonder's going to come. And, you know, there's kind of, you know, whispering, I don't care who you are, you know, at that time, if Stevie Wonder is going to come to your studio, um, that's heavy. 
And absolutely. And again, I'm not going to pretend to be somebody I'm not. I didn't grow up on Stevie's music. I was uh-huh. certainly aware of it. I mean, if you didn't know songs in the key of life and, you know, you hear some of those songs, I, I, I write a whole article about songs in the key of life because that was the first album recorded at Hit Factory in New York. When hit the oh, wow, very okay. first record, there's a whole oh. story behind that that we don't have time to go into. But um, so it was just we were kind of gearing up for this day when Stevie Wonder is going to come to the studio, and you know Michael's looking good. I mean Michael's a rock star. He's some days he's showing up in a flannel shirt and you know black corduroy, but other days. You know, he's he's buffing up. I mean, Karen Fay is, you know, she's popping in and out. Uh, Michael Bush is, you know, they're bringing in racks of wardrobe. This is all new to me. I mean, to have, to be in the room with Michael Jackson and Mike, I don't know who Michael Bush is back then. And they're bringing in r- racks. And Michael's, I think they set up like a little changing curtain for him or something. Not on this day, but I'm just right. I'm trying to set the scene. Yeah. Um, so Stevie, this was almost like day to day of Michael being, and Michael was there, I'd say four and a half days out of five. I mean, he might disappear a little bit, but for them, mm-hmm. you know, other people might disagree with me, maybe four days out of five, but he was very active in the bad album. Um, to, to my, to my recollection. Mm-hmm. So finally it's time for Stevie. And I don't, I don't remember. I, I know in the, in the Spike Lee movie there, they did have some film crew there and I didn't go back and do any research, but I, I do, we rarely had cameras in, in the studio with us. Very rarely. Michael didn't like it. Um, but on that day, the camera, there was a film crew there. And um, so Michael, what, he was wearing like his red shirt or whatever. I think there's pictures of him. Um, yeah. He's wearing like a red jacket. And I think, um, yeah, yeah, there you go. So, yeah. And I think they, yeah, they set up some lights. And so it, it wasn't really a normal vocal because there were so many people there, which was really uncharacteristic. But we still went through all the normal vocal prep for Michael. We had to have the hot water. We had to have the room really warm. There was a whole series of steps we went through. Brute, um, and then we set the two mics up, you know, so they could they could face each other. Mm-hmm. And um, I was there. Um, I'm off the top of my head. If I had to guess, I'd say there were ten or twelve people in the control room. Um, which is a lot, you know, for most Michael vocals, um, there might be four or five. I mean, Quincy would be there. Rod would be there. It might, might be six people, but this one, there were, there were just more people. It was kind of a big deal. Hmm. Michael Boddicker was there because he provided the, the keyboard that Stevie played. Um, so Stevie shows up and, I can't remember. I'm not trying to sound sound dumb or like a smart aleck. I know he didn't drive himself, but I can't remember if he had a driver or or if he he, he had a girlfriend. Um, this is a photo from that night, um, and I I feel terrible because I cannot remember this young lady's name, um, huh. but she she was there and really really pretty girl. Um, and she may have driven him, but maybe he had a driver. I can't remember. Okay. But, but as soon as he comes in, um, I think he came into the control room, and um, and it's just instant joke fest. I mean, it's him and Quincy going back and forth. Um, Bruce is very comfortable in that kind of situation. I'm not saying a word. You know, this is not time for the Brad Sunberg, you know, humor. <laughs> I'm, I'm smarter than that. Yeah. But – my, and you can tell Michael loves Stevie and there's just, it's a little bit of a love fest going on and it's Stevie wonder. It's like, this is, this is awesome. I, I get to be in the same room, not only in the same room, but I, I'm going to get to hear this guy sing and play. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty sure we did vocals first. I've been trying to remember the order. Um, I'm pretty sure we did vocals first. So Michael and Stevie go out to the studio and um, either me or Craig or one of the assistants, you know, you go out and you kind of set the microphone so it's at the right height and all that and, you know, ask if they want water or anything. Um, and then it's, it's showtime. You know, everybody leaves the studio. In, in recording studios, we, we call it the control room and the studio, the, the two separate rooms. So, or sometimes the tracking room or whatever. So we leave the two of them out there. The film crew may have stayed. I, you know, if somebody wants to contradict me with video, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm not going to get my feelings hurt, but, um, but the film, so they start filming it. Um, and we only did, so I, I still have, um, this is called the, the comp sheet. So these are the lyrics uh, for Just Good Friends. But okay. basically this, I, according to this, I think we did about 11 takes. So they, they sang the, the song about 11 times, something like that, wow. from what it looks like to me. And then what we do is it's called comping. Um, now we didn't do the comping that night. So they, they probably, when Michael sang, um, we usually recorded any for lead vocal anywhere from six to 25, 30 takes. Um, and he'd sing the whole song. It wasn't like sing a phrase and then go play a video game and sing another. No, I mean, we'd, we'd sing the song, sing the song. So on this, to the best of my memory, it looks like, they did about 11 passes, something like that. Um, and then we, we're not going to comp the vocals that night. So then Stevie came into the control room. And then it's time for him to do his synth solo. It's, you know, is it is it a little dated sounding? Sure. Um, but in Stevie Wonder, you know, exactly. and he, he probably, again, I'm just going on, on memory and assumption, but I'm going to guess he did it three, four times. I mean, it wasn't like an arduous, let's, you know, strain over this for hours. I mean, he he knocked it out. Um, And then there were a bunch more jokes and maybe some sushi or Oh, I do remember one thing. And I think Quincy's talked about this too. Um, After the vocals, everyone was so excited. Michael just naturally came into the control room. Everybody came into the control room and left Stevie (laughs) Left in the studio. <laughs> like, I remember seeing that in the documentary. He was like, ah, I, I guess I forgot about him, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like somebody go get Stevie. Uh, yeah. So we get it done. And, uh, you know, Bruce and Quincy and Michael listen to it and, and Stevie and, and, and they're happy with it. Um, it's, it's what they set out to do. It's not a brilliant song you know michael's written other songs and michael didn't write this song but um right, right. michael's done other songs that literally give me goosebumps to this day when i hear them um i'm not gonna say just good friends you know you know covers me with goosebumps but it's a moment in time and yeah. i think it was really important for michael to do it um you guys have all, I don't have it in front of me, but you've seen that picture of, uh, uh, I think Stevie is either at a console or he's in a recording studio and Michael's kind of standing behind him watching him. Yeah, or, for, I, I believe it for uh, Songs in the Key of Life sessions, I believe. Really? Yeah, I, yeah, whenever, okay. whenever he was a kid, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I, I now that does kind of give me goosebumps just a little bit. Um, so I think there's just such a really sweet big brother, little brother, um, moment that I think Michael wanted to include Stevie in this project. Um, so that's how I hear the song. Um, and I, I don't, again, I don't passive. I have a real bad problem. I, I don't passively listen to this music. It's really hard for me. Um, yeah. I hear it and I'm back in that room and Stevie wonder is sitting right there in my memory and Michael is sitting right behind him. And 
so it's this kind of waterfall of memories that um, that I experience when I when I hear this music. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't mean that it that doesn't make it a great song for everybody else, but I think it's a song that you know it, it, it's kind of an underdog. Um, you know, there's some there's polls on Facebook and stuff. If one song had to get kicked off the bad album, what would it be? And it's like, uh, I'm not just good friends. I mean, uh, <laughs> to me, it's just, it's just kind of a sweet moment in time. No, no, I think that's fair, and and I think anybody who would be in your position to see that much talent in the same room at the same time and working on stuff, yeah, you would want to like you can't help but tie those memories to it. Um, at the same time, as a fan, I have to, you know, have to call my, I want to make sure I'm not being hypocritical because I do have to catch myself and not measure one song with the other. So countless times I've compared I Can't Help It, which had, you know, Stevie, Michael, Quincy, and the whole nine right. yards. And then you look at Just Good Friends and you're like, okay, well, if they did it here right. and it knocked it out of the park, then why didn't Just Good Friends do the same thing? So I understand that yeah. dilemma as a fair, fan. To- totally fair, fair play. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it, it's kind of one of those songs that um, it's you know it's got the fun little sparring thing, kind of like he you know him and Paul McCartney. Yep, the girl is mine. Yeah. yeah, so it's I think it was a little bit of an homage to to that, and you know, kind of their friendship. You know, could it or should it have been you know something a little little heftier? Yeah, maybe, but uh, but that's that's how I remember the song. So Brad, let me ask you this, knowing that, I mean, just looking at the talent that's involved, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Was there any discussion of, you know, Michael presenting something for Stevie to work on that he had written himself? Or was there something that Stevie said, hey, you know, I'm working on something good because around this time he's recording characters, um, you know, the characters album. So Mm -hmm. was there any discussion of them possibly bringing a song to the table and saying, hey, you know, maybe we can work on this instead? Or was it just like, hey, we got what we have in front of us and we're just going to knock it out of the park as best as we can? Um, I'm, I'm, I always try to be a hundred percent honest. I don't remember. I, I don't, okay. I have no recollection of, you know, and then, and they had their own late night phone calls and, you know, their own friendships. So there, there may have been some back and forth, but not that night or, you know, not, not in my presence that I recall. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let me, let me ask you this as, you know, obviously as someone who's worked with Michael and Stevie at the same time, um, kind of taking your engineer hat off and being a fan for a second, which one do you favor a little bit more? Just Good Friends or Get It, which did appear on the characters album? Um, I'd, I'd have to say Just Good Friends. Okay. I mean, just okay. just because of, I mean, the, the two productions are, are very different, but um, by then I, I was so used to the Quincy machine, you know, I mean, it was just, everything is so perfectly polished. Um yeah, I'm, 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 me personally, I'm going to lean towards that. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And I know we're kind of drifting a little bit away from Just Good Friends in this question, and if so, I apologize. Drift away. Um, you had mentioned that, you know, from the time that record was hit to the time it was out, Michael would go through a song full out, like there were no breaks in between. Um, um, which, or or oh. go ahead. In other words, from the first phrase until the final chorus? Yeah, so like he would sing a song full out. No, no, no. Let, no, no. Let, me, let me correct that. If he's doing a take, um, and not so much on Just Good Friends, but just on any of the songs, I mean, he's eating popcorn, he's chewing gum, he's um, drawing pictures, he's laughing. So no, he's going to make, and he's going to make mistakes. He's not perfect. He's amazing, right? right? He's not perfect. Um, mm-hmm. So no, we would, you know, Bruce would stop him from time to time, you know, Bruce would call him Smelly. Um, you know, hey, Smelly, let's go back and, and punch that in right there. Um, yeah. But he would, with the lead vocal, he would sing the song top to bottom. Um, okay. But there might be a couple hiccups along the way. Gotcha. Okay. Now, as far as um, him laying down a lead vocal for a song, can you do you remember any song from the Bad Album where he, it seemed like he put – like it was just revisited multiple, multiple times. Like which one do you remember? Like, man, like Michael's spending a lot of time on this song. This is fun, Chris. I, I actually like this. You're, you're making me think and not just, uh, yeah. not just talk. Um, 
I got to cheat. I got to look at the list. Um, no, no, go for it. Go for it. That's what it's there for. Yeah. I mean, one of the ones, the first one that pops out is another part of me. Um, mm. That was a tricky song and I've got to be, I've got to be politically careful. Uh, you know, Matt Forger did that for Captain EO. For Captain there were some, EO, there were some right. things in that song that Michael loved on Captain EO mm-hmm. and Bruce and Quincy, it was a it was a bit challenging sometimes to get it back to where Michael really liked it. Um, but I'm not saying the Vogue. I I don't remember Michael struggling. Okay, well this is kind of funny. I flipped the page and I could I just can't stop loving you. Uh, yeah. That one it was fine during the project, um, but then at the end of the project we're doing Moonwalker. We're doing tour prep. We're trying to get mixes done. And then Michael or somebody comes up with the idea of doing I Just Can't Stop Loving You. We used to call it I Just Can't Stop Rubbing You. Um, They're going to start doing (laughs) – sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. Um, We're going to start – we're going to do those both in French and Spanish. Oh, that's right. And so I got moved into Studio C to help with the recording over there. And that was just a debacle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the the Spanish one, and I, I, you know, my French friends are laughing right now because they know what I'm going to say. Um, the Spanish one was actually really pretty. Um, yeah. And it's right on the tip of my tongue. Who who did the translation? R- Ruben Blades. Thank you. Wow. Yes. Good good call. Um, mm-hmm. So Ruben did that. The French one was a bit more of a mess. Um, that yeah. was. Quincy's girlfriend that did the translation. Okay. And that was, so I mean, working with Michael and he was good natured. I mean, he was laughing, but at one point, and it wasn't me, but, and I won't mention his name because I have too much respect for him, but the engineer, uh, a different engineer, like erased a whole chunk of, of lead vocal uh, of the Spanish, <laughs> Spanish version. And I, I'm going to tell Michael, and uh, he was, you know, he took a deep breath and he's like, okay, you know, let's do it again. But, um, but stuff like that can, can be, can be challenging. You know, I, honestly, I mean, I'm looking through these song titles. I, I don't think there was one that was just tremendously more difficult than anything else. Um, on the dangerous album, we did a song and I, I got not to tell too many stories, but um I want people to come to my seminar. Um, yeah. <laughs> we did a song on the Dangerous album called Gone Too Soon. Gone Too and, Soon, yeah. And that, that was a rough one. Um, my, At that point, when Michael did a vocal, it was usually, um, I don't say always, but it was usually just me and Bruce that would be in the room. Um, I mean, sometimes Teddy might be there. I mean, I, I don't say always, but it was often just me and Bruce. Um mm-hmm. And on that one, Michael actually, he asked me to leave. He, it's such a, a heavy, you know, emotional song that he really want, he would have had Bruce leave if he could have done it by himself. Right. But, <laughs> but somebody had to actually get it on tape. So yeah. anyway. Mm. No, no, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm glad that you uh, took the time to, you know, put some thought into that and, and even share some some things with me I've never heard before. I never knew that a chunk of the Spanish version of I just got, uh, just can't stop loving you got erased, you know, like that's, that's, that's crazy to think about. And, and you bring up a good point though. Like, you know, when we we're so used to speaking in our native language that when you have to learn another language, it's not like riding a bicycle. Like, I mean, you got, to, it takes a lot of time yeah. to get it. So um, yeah, it's, so it's hats off to Michael for doing that. Well, and, and now a minute ago, we talked about Michael singing the whole song on the yeah. Spanish French. I mean, it's literally just, Como, you know, whatever it was, como la brisa, uh, blah, yeah. blah, blah, you know, whatever it is. And, and so, I mean, it was just phrase by phrase, but, sure. but, but they did a good job of kind of building a, the, I think the Spanish fans, um, and, and I, you know, I, I've taught and I've been to Mexico, you know, a few times and, and taught, um, brought my events down there. I think the Spanish fans and same in Spain, um, really love those versions the the french fans french fans just they're like get that french one out of here uh, 
did not go well at all. But but Michael was just trying to give a little gift, just kind of do something cool yeah. for the fans. Yeah. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so so let me ask you this: as we kind of dip towards the the end of the conversation, uh, what are some things that you take away from from any of the sessions, whether it be bad, dangerous, or even history? Right. Um, I'm I'm going to even expound on it beyond that, and okay. just w- working closely with Michael. I mean, on video shoots, and I'm, I'm not tooting my horn or anything, but you know, Neverland. I mean, all the all the projects that we were involved in. Um, mm-hmm. He 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 was an amazing guy. Um, hard work, hard work, hard work. You know, what, whatever the phrase is. You know, practice, 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 and then practice some more. So work ethic like really like nothing i've ever seen um and then um and i I say this you know i say this in all my seminars but gratitude um he treated everybody well and um he was he, he was genuinely one of the kindest people i've ever met and i've worked with you know rich people poor people famous people nobodies um you treat people right and and that gets you a lot further in my opinion. Um, so, I mean, you felt special when you were around him, you, you, you were drawn. I mean, he, he definitely had a magnetism. I mean, whatever word you want to use the it factor, I mean, whatever that is, but he'd walk into a room and you would sense it. I mean, he was a rock star. It didn't matter if he was wearing pajama pants and, and a down jacket, uh-huh. He was a rock star, and and it's like this is right where I want to be. I I want to be near this guy, and uh, help him out however I can. So, mm. so I'm, I'm so I'm grateful. I mean, I'm very blessed and and grateful to uh, have watched him and learned from him and uh, and been a friend to him. That's awesome. Um, and, and I can think of, you know, just the countless interviews and, and articles I've read about Michael's uh, gratitude to your point. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard the saying, you never want to meet your hero because they'll just let you down. Um, but from what I've heard about Michael, like, he, like you said, he made people feel special around him whenever he, whenever he was in the room. So that, that's great that, you know, even now, like he still has that reputation of making people feel like they're part of the journey with him. You know, like you don't feel like you're lesser than you feel like you're right there with them. So that's awesome. So, yeah, I I think that that's great that, uh, that, you know, that just from the time that you spent with Michael, there's so much that you learned. I mean, that's again. And and how I meant to ask, how old were you when you first started working at Westlake and then getting involved in bad? Oh, wow. Twenty two, I think 22. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, and I was, yeah, I was a pup. Michael was five years older than me. Yeah. So, so he was 26, 27. Um, I might've just been, yeah, yeah. 21, 22, you know, something like that. Um, okay. and I stay, I, I wasn't with him constantly for 18 years, but he'd keep calling me in project after project after project. Um, so I was, I, I was, around his camp for more than 18 years. Okay. So um, I'll ask you a question that I've asked other artists that I've done interviews with. Um, uh, what would you say are your five favorite albums of all time? Oh, man. And they don't, and and they don't necessarily have to be Michael. I mean, they can be <laughs> if you want them to, but just your five favorite albums of all time today. Oh, okay. I, I know it's subject to change. Um. I'm going to change the the question just a little bit and say more like influential or albums that had some sort of impact on me. Um, I I have to say uh, Pink Floyd, uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Um, That just pulled me into this ridiculous industry at at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I got to say Thriller. I mean, um, on Thriller, there's two songs that just, the whole album is amazing, but Lady in My Life, which I know is another underdog, and I think it's yes. a spectacular song. Um, I agree. Nature, human, just put a net on me and, and pulled me in. Um, mm-hmm. Man, 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 five. You put me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> I mean, I 
Mom, don't listen to this just for two seconds. But uh, I mean, it, it, ACDC back in black. I mean, stop. There you go. It's just there you so go. it's just so good. Um, uh, Van Halen. Which one do you choose? I mean, that that's the stuff I grew up with. Um, you yeah. know, 1984, uh, all that stuff. And I'll probably do one out of left field, but it just it's it's a moment in time for me. It's a time that I can still see like it was yesterday, which is Frampton Comes Alive. Um, wow, that is out of left field. Why, why that one? I'm a kid from Santa Cruz, California. And if you've ever been to Santa Cruz or if you know anything about it, it's a beach town with with this cool little amusement park. And back then, and I'm not like a pot, you know, it's not, you know, I'm not like some little druggie or something. <laughs> it was just such a cool place to be and such a cool time to be there and everything you're young and you're looking ahead at life and there's the ocean. And that was the soundtrack was Frampton comes alive. And uh, so it just kind of, and there's 500 other songs that do that to you and to me, but um, yeah, if I had to just pull five out of thin air, that'd probably be the five right now. Man, those those are five solid choices, man. I, I got to hand it to you for. And again, I know I put you on the spot, but you you aced it. No, that it. was fun. <laughs> and and I think mind. and I'm honest. I'm you know I didn't I didn't grow up. I loved disco. I really did. I know that's like a that's like blasphemy. I grew up on ABBA, Gloria Gaynor, uh, Commodores, but in my heart, I'm probably a bit more of a rock and roll guy, but. Yeah. To merge and, and now, so then you 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 end up with Michael, where you're doing Dirty Diana and Black or White and Give In to Me. Mm-hmm. I got the best of both worlds. Exactly. So, so that's why I say he's a rock star more than the King of Pop, in my opinion. Well said. Well said. Well, Brett, thank you so much for for taking time out to you know to kind of bring us into your world and kind of put us right there in the studio with you and, and, you know, just share those intimate moments. Um, I'm sure everyone that's watching is really going to appreciate that. And uh, for, for the folks watching, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, stay tuned for the next episode. I'm sure Brad's got a, got a hot one. Uh, cooked up for you. <laughs> Chris, this was fun. Um, it really was. I, it, it, uh, I wanted to do a song on my own little series. I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to have, to have a guest host and you, you did fantastic. So thank, thank, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, um, you've already said the farewell, but I'll say it also. So uh, thanks guys for tuning in. I will talk to you soon. Take care.